Hello, and welcome to the third lecture for Chapter 5, covering the third section of Chapter 5, a chapter all about light. In the previous two sections, we've covered about how we see light in our everyday lives and just the idea of how we perceive light. Right? Scientists would apply, apply those same ideas too in their everyday lives, I suppose. In the second section, we talked about what is light as being a wave and a particle simultaneously. And we introduced the electromagnetic spectrum with all its different types of light. So now we're going to move away from light, seemingly, and talk about matter. But this is all in service to explaining how light makes us able to discover things about matter. Such an important connection. Because you can't just go and take a sample of a star that's millions or billions of light years away, but you can learn a lot about it by looking at the light it creates because we understand matter. But what do we need to understand about matter? Well, we need to understand the structure of matter, the phases, and the energy that's stored in atoms, and the particular way that that energy is stored in atoms. At least one way. There's, there's some that we won't discuss, but we're gonna we'll discuss one very important particular way. Okay, so what is the structure of matter? Well, first of all, there is a lot of atoms, okay? So depending on the size of what you're seeing this, this video on, this dot has somewhere around 10 million atoms that could fit in it, okay? So it gives you an idea of how small an atom is. Remember, an atom is on the scale of about 10 to the negative 10 meters. I've mentioned this before in the, in the last video. Call it angstrom, very, very small size, okay? Average atom, all right? And here's that number again, by the way, okay? So if you take one of those 10 million atoms and zoom in on it, you see that most of the space of that tiny diameter at 10 to the negative 10 meters, okay, um, which would be 100 millionth of a um, uh, 10 to the negative 11, so actually 1 10 millionth, 1 10 millionth of a meter is the size, but it's mostly this weird cloud stuff, all right? So this is what's called a probability cloud, which is a very, very abstract idea, but essentially it's it's where the electron exists, but since the electron is, like light, a wave and a particle simultaneously, the electron actually doesn't exist just in one place at one time, but has a certain probability of existing in different places at different times, with more probability at some, some locations than other in a 3D sense. That creates what's called the electron cloud. But the cloud is most of this volume, and it's mostly empty. It's filled with this very, very tiny particle, the electron, existing as a wave and vibrating around, also existing as a particle. So 100 thousandth of that volume is the nucleus, a tiny little center at that big, loose, low-density cloud that is the electron or electrons. And that nucleus is where all the positive charge of the atom is and where all the, the neutrons are located. So the nucleus of the atom is composed collectively of what are called nucleons because they're in the nucleus and their names are protons and neutrons. Okay? So in summary, all atoms have electrons which are outside the nucleus as a cloud and inside the nucleus there are protons and neutrons. Okay? Now, in one case, hydrogen in its most common form actually just has a single proton, but every other nucleus would have at least one neutron. All right, now, some important terms for atomic structure are the following. Atomic number, specifically, that, that expression, is the number of protons in the nucleus. This is a very important concept, the atomic number, because it tells you exactly where you would look on the periodic table. The ultimate reference document or reference poster for all of chemistry, but it's also very closely tied in with physics and astronomy. So the periodic table is listed by the number of protons. That's what defines an element. In other words, every gold atom has the same number of protons. Every hydrogen atom has a precisely one proton. They can have different number of electrons, different numbers of neutrons, but they can never have different numbers of protons because that would make them a different atom, okay? That's what defines the atomic, mostly the properties and really what, what sets its behavior, okay? But the atomic mass number 
includes consideration of the neutrons, okay? Because it's simply the sum. Now that's relevant because there's lots of cases where there is an element, especially the heavier elements, that have certain amounts of the population of that element that don't all have the same number of neutrons. For example, if you look at uranium, the heaviest naturally occurring element, some uranium has 235 for its atomic mass number, other has other uranium has 238. So you can have U for uranium with an atomic mass number of 235, but then you can have another form of uranium with atomic mass number of 238. They both occur. Uh, I believe 238 is the less the less likely, but I might I might have switched them up in my mind. But case being, the only thing that makes them different is different numbers of neutrons. Thus, they have different atomic mass numbers. The number of protons is the same in both cases. I believe it's 92, okay? I have to check the periodic table, but it's right around there. That's their atomic number, number of protons. I bring this up because the term for these two different versions of uranium are isotopes, okay? So both of these would be considered an isotope of uranium. Okay, usually the most common version, especially if most of the population of an, of an element is, is all the same, then the rare types are called the isotope and the normal ones just called, well, normal element whatever. So hydrogen, for example, with one proton is just hydrogen. Hydrogen with a proton and a neutron, so with an atomic mass number of two instead of one, well, that type of hydrogen is actually called deuterium, which is what makes heavy water, if you ever heard of it, all right? so. Isotopes, different numbers of neutrons, same number of protons, okay? By the way, molecules consist of two or more atoms, okay? They are a bond. There's a number of ways that, that atoms can bond with each other, and they create these stable groupings of atoms, okay? So here's more on the isotope, okay? This isn't going to be the example of hydrogen, but instead carbon. So there's carbon-12, okay? That's an isotope of carbon. It has a 12 because its atomic mass number is 12. It can also be written as follows with a superscript uh, behind the C, behind the letter representing the element, in this case C. And the, the simple idea is that it has six protons and six, ne six neutrons for the sum of 12. Okay, so what is the atomic number here? Well, the atomic number is 12. Sorry, so I, thought, I thought six and I said 12, excuse me there. The atomic number is six. Okay, so the mass number, the atomic mass number, that's the one that's 12, but the atomic number is six. I know they sound very similar, but the atomic number, why is it six? Because there's six protons. Will that number ever change with the different isotopes? It sure won't. Look, six protons, six protons. The only thing that changes is the number of neutrons, because if we change the number of protons, it wouldn't be carbon anymore. All right, so we got carbon-13, which has an extra neutron, so seven now, and finally carbon-14, which has two more neutrons than carbon-12, giving us a total sum of protons and neutrons of 14. Isotopes of carbon, all right? And these are all real isotopes of carbon, some much more common, commonly found than others, okay? So thought question for you. Check our understanding of this new atomic terminology. The symbol for HE, represents helium with an atomic mass number of four, okay? Notice this is the atomic mass number, not the atomic number. And it is the most common form of helium. That's what I was talking about, most common isotope. It, and it does contain two protons and two neutrons. Okay, well, what does the heli what does the symbol 3HE represent? All right, is it A, helium with one proton and two neutrons? B, helium with two protons and one neutron, or helium with three protons, or can it not exist? What do you think? What's the correct answer here? Pause if you need to, review. It is helium with two protons and one neutron. How do we know that? Because you know all the other options, at least A through C, all still sum up to three, right? But in different ways. It's because we can't change the atomic number. The two protons must be the same because we're still talking about helium. All right? So that's the basics of what an atom is, what defines an A isotope, and the three building blocks of an atom, electrons, protons, and neutrons. Okay, so now let's zoom out a little bit and talk about 
pieces of matter on probably the macroscopic level and how they can phase change and how that's really important for understanding energy flows through a system. Well, the three phases of matter are solid, liquid, and gas, okay? Now the phases of some, of the same material, excuse me, behave differently because of differences in chemical bonds. So not all gases behave the same. There's def definitely some differences there. There are groups of gases that could actually are pretty predictable and behave the same, including a group called the ideal gases. But even then, you know, it's not that there's some variation in behavior. And then some gases of very large molecules behave quite, quite strangely, all right? And then you have liquids that are as exotic as mercury, right? Which has very strange liquid properties, although it is a liquid at room temperature, right? Or, or even more, there's elements that you would never think of as, be, as being a solid under any conditions that we're familiar with here on Earth, but under the incredible conditions that exist out in space, even in the interior of massive planets in our own solar system, hydrogen, a, a very, very low density gas, is condensed by high pressure and gravity into a solid. Pretty, pretty remarkable, all right? So what are the, the processes of phase changing? Well, um, we're going to discuss them right now as going up in energy and the where that where that energy goes, what what happens to the conversion of energy. Essentially, how we can put kinetic energy into a system and have that then um, essentially release energy or bring up potential energy. So, have when there are bonds that exist between molecules or bonds that exist between electrons and the nucleus, an idea we'll talk about more in just a moment, that we can, those, those bonds exist in a potential energy well, in a sense, in the same way that we're stuck on the planet Earth, that it takes energy to get out of the gravitational influence of Earth. Likewise, molecular bonds are in a low energy state, but if you put energy in, you can get the pieces to break apart by giving them escape velocity like you would a rocket that's leaving Earth, and now you have changed the phase, you, be, you, make, you made the matter more energetic and less bound together, okay? And I was gonna say that when we do this, we are actually gonna talk about one more phase of matter, which is the often follow up to the, oh, there's three phases. Well, have you ever heard of the fourth? Well, the fourth is just plasma. And what plasma is, is simply ionized gases. So it's a gas that's become energetic enough that there are no more electrons around the nuclei of any of the atoms. They're all fully ionized. Um, that happens because they've they, they just become so energetic that they, they aren't bound to the nucleus anymore. So whatever nucleus it is, whether it's the single proton of a hydrogen nucleus or, or two protons and two, two neutrons of a, of a helium nucleus, that, that nucleus is, is left on its own, still moving around in the gas, but the electrons would just be ricocheting around and would be part of, you know, part of that system, but not bound to any nucleus, okay? And if you're not sure what I mean by electrons being bound to the nucleus, kind of consider that cloud we saw, and we're actually gonna talk more about that from an energy perspective, okay? So finally, take a look, right? So we got solid phase, okay? There, the molecules are very tightly held together, but if you raise the temperature and also raise the energy or bring energy into the system, you can break those bonds, all right? Bring them out of that low energy stable state, bring, you know, give them escape velocity, and turn them into a phase where they have atoms and molecules that remain together in chains or sheets, but that there's movement of those chains and sheets relative to each other, creating a liquid. If you further put in energy and temperature, right, if you further increase them, then you can turn now that liquid into a gas. Now, whereas liquids have a defined volume, Okay, so they will fill a or they they'll fill a certain volume, but they just won't they won't expand freely. Liquids do not expand freely. Gases do because there are no more bonds between them. They expand freely and will just become lower density to fill in whatever space they are given. All right. Now, if you continue to put in energy and raise the temperature under most pressure pressure conditions to thousands of Kelvin. Okay, and to put that in perspective. Um, hundreds of Kelvin is, is room temperature, you know, potentially. So for example, room temperature is 293 Kelvin, right? That's the, that would be equivalent to about, um, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, so hundreds of Kelvin could be twice that, right? We could have, you know, 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 150 degrees Fahrenheit, enough certainly to boil many gases or, you know, boil many liquids and create a gas phase. But if we go up in the thousands, now we're talking, you know, surface of the sun hot. 
and we have molecular dis disassociation. So this is how we can take a molecule like um, you know, H2O or CO2 or O3, which is ozone, or large molecules like for methane or ammonia in gaseous phase and split them apart, actually break them into their individual um, components, into their individual atoms, okay? Whereas here, see, we had, in this case, this looked like a molecule, particularly H2O with two, two hydrogens and a larger oxygen. If we're splitting it apart, now we just have individual hydrogens, the small one, and the larger oxygens. Okay, so the gas is actually a, is is a different it, it's a different substance now. We refer to it as a different molecular name, um, but it's still all the same atoms. However, if we continue to put in energy and continue to, you know, um, energize the system. Oh, and most importantly, raise the temperature now to tens of thousands of Kelvin. Okay, so interior temperatures of the sun. Then we get to that mythical plasma phase. Okay, a particular um, so, you know, it is often associated with the sun. Uh, it wouldn't be the direct surface, but just beneath the sun, we have, you know, superheated convection cells of plasma. And what's happened here is that we need to zoom in and consider, you know, all these individual atoms that used to be molecules, and all of them have their own electron clouds, but now they've kicked the electrons out. Right, so they've lost, they've lost the electrons, and they're just they all all that remains is the positive nucleus left behind, with the individual electron now off on its own, not part of an atom anymore. All right. Now, what's um, interesting is that you can have ionization where you just lost some electrons, and then you can distinguish between that and full ionization, where there is truly just not that every single electron has been ionized. So in the case of oxygen, which often has eight electrons if it's neutral, well then it's eight, it would have, would have to lose all eight, which is actually a much higher temperature phenomenon than just losing one, all right? And in that case, to be fully ionized takes millions, which is down to the edges of the core of the sun, which is at about 10 million, okay, a, a, a star like our sun. Um, now the 10 million part is a different story. The very, the very center of a star, once you get up in the tens of millions of Kelvin, then you actually get into nuclear processes. So it's kind of interesting, right? It's almost like we really are, we're breaking things apart all the way down to breaking the electrons off from the nucleus. But then eventually we can actually start, excuse me on that, we can actually start breaking the nucleus apart. So if we were to go up to the next level, right, we'd look just at the nucleus and we break that apart. But that takes tens of millions of Kelvin but just a couple of million, so one, two, is not enough to do that. You have to have to be above that range of about 10 million Kelvin to start breaking the nucleus. And you're not truly, it's not fission, by the way, you're just fusing it with another nucleus. All right, not that fission isn't a thing. We, you, know, you can release energy through fission, but I'm talking more about fusion. The name, names for some of these, um, these phase changes, melting is just the name for breaking from a, um, a solid to a liquid, evaporation, liquid, to, um, well, a gas. Disassociation is when you go from a molecular, ga molecular gas to an atomic gas, and then ionization is where you lose some or all of the electrons from the atom, leaving behind a positively charged nucleus. All right, now you can have phase changes that aren't, you know, kind of happening all at once to a, a large collection of matter, but it instead are the a, a small sample, like a, you know, like a small, a tiny portion of a population of atoms, um, and that that's kind of that represents a constant flow of interactions, especially on the edges of substances. A great example of that is considering the ocean and the atmosphere. So it's not as if the ocean is boiling, but the ocean is still evaporating. And evaporation and boiling are both a phase change, but boiling is a bulk evaporation. So it's a whole body of liquid evaporating at once, all right? And evaporating from the bottom, so bubbling up from the from the hottest, you know, the hottest part, the bottom of the liquid, and you know, being being able to hold those um, those bubbles against pressure, and then bringing them up before they pop. But evaporation is totally different because evaporation doesn't require so much energy. It's just the it's the concept that that are going to be some molecules within the liquid which get bounced around in such a way that they're just going faster than the average, and they'll have enough energy to break free of the liquid bonds and just become an individual molecule and be, become in a gaseous state, a gaseous state. And then they might actually ricochet around more and pick up more energy, but for every, or at least, you know, there's a, a likelihood depending on the conditions of molecules going the other way and being 
in the gaseous phase, but losing energy through collisions and, and interactions and electromagnetically and so on, and then crashing into the liquid and not, not having enough energy to remain a gas and instead then falling into a bond and getting stuck in a bond and becoming part of the liquid, right? So there's a constant exchange, right? And sometimes the rate of evaporation is higher than the rate of condensation and sometimes the other way. So thought question, what are some of the immediate consequences of the increased overall global temperature caused by global warming based on this, this concept of evaporation and condensation? Should we expect, expect melting ice caps, increased global cloud cover, increased sea levels, all of the above, or only A and C? So what do you think? All right, make sure you have an A answer. All of the above, all right? So we have melting, right? Because the temperature is going to go up, stimulating that phase change. We're then going to have a greater amount of evaporation. That's going to bring many H2O molecules from our vast amount of you know, oceans, bodies of water, up into the atmosphere, okay? And we're then, despite that, going to have more water coming in through melting than we are through evaporation. And so that's going to cause the sea levels to rise and, you know, along with having more water in the atmosphere, right? Because we'll be losing almost all of the frozen water. So last topic here, perhaps the most interesting, maybe the most delicate, the most subtle, but very, very, very important is zooming in on this concept of ionization, okay? And in particular, what precedes ionization. Because if the story for atoms was, was simply this, we'll zoom back, that an atom has a cloud of electrons and sometimes an electron just jumps out. And if it doesn't, then it doesn't. Then we wouldn't be able to learn too much about atoms because we could figure out how much energy it took to kick an electron out and we, that'd be helpful, but that'd be it. It'd be an all or nothing situation. But it turns out that that's not the case. We can find out how much energy it takes to actually just increase the size of the cloud, essentially. Because we can stimulate the atom, give it some energy, make the electron more excited, give it a larger diameter cloud, give it a higher orbit, but not ionize it, not actually kick it out of the atom. Make it, make it so it's still bonded to the nucleus because there's a natural attraction between the negative, ele negatively charged electron and the positively charged nucleus. So keep it, keep it in that system, but just more excited. And those energy levels are relatively small, very particular to individual elements, so individual atoms, and can be created, the energies can be created with light and exactly match the energy of photons. Or, well, you can find a photon that exactly matches. So then you can have a photon go into an atom, get absorbed, or a photon come out of an atom, get released. Let's discuss the process. Okay. So electrons in atoms are restricted to particular energy levels. All right. So first, there's energy levels below ionization, right? So it's not all or nothing. You can put energy into the system. The electron can go up and down. But interestingly, if we can, if we we'll go back to that orbit analogy, which I, I mentioned briefly, you know, planets can go up and down, right? It's not like a if you have a you know a planet that goes that is orbiting a star, it's not as if that 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 planet can either orbit the star, you know, or the planet has to fly off out you know out of the out of the gravitational pull of the star into deep space or a satellite, right? It's not like it's not like we only have satellites at, at one altitude above the surface of Earth and there's nowhere else satellites can go. We have satellites at many, many different orbits. And in fact, we can put a satellite at any orbit. It's a continuum, right? We can, you know, we can fine tune satellites. We can have them in, at any particular orbit, at any particular distance from the surface of Earth that we want, okay? As long as they're not too low and they fall into the atmosphere, okay? But here's the thing, that doesn't hold for electrons. Electrons in that strange cloud around the nucleus, they can only exist in particular energy levels that correspond to, by the way, complex shape, shapes of where the electrons most likely to be found, but the energy levels can be thought of as, as steps. And the electrons simply cannot exist in between. It's not, it's not a, oh, they, they usually can't, they absolutely cannot. This is the same idea that you can't break a photon into a smaller piece. There is no smaller energy step than the ones, and they're set by the nucleus. Every nucleus has its 
own particular energy steps. Hydrogen has particular energy steps. Helium has particular, particular energy steps. A isotope of either of those have their own particular energy steps, similar but slightly different. So the famous energy steps for hydrogen are the following, all right? To go from the lowest level, so that's the, the electron that is as close to the nucleus as it can go, so as deep in the, the energy well of the atom as possible, to the next lowest, which would be the first excited level, level two, well, that difference is 10.2 electron volts, right? Electron volt being this tiny measurement of energy equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, right? A way to quantify small chunks of energy. So 10.2 10 of those small chunks of energy is the gap between zero and the next highest, okay? This is as low as the electron can go. Here is slightly excited. And the electron cannot go in between. So that electron cannot accept, see? five electron volts because it, it wouldn't there's it, there's nothing there it cannot exist in that state nor can it accept 11 because then again it would be in a state it can't exist in all right now it could accept from the ground state it could accept 12.1 all right so you could, it could accept 12.1 electron volts that's fine because then it could jump all the way from the ground to level three so it can skip steps but it has to land exactly on a step and each of these energy values corresponds to a photon coming in because the photon carries the energy necessary to give to the electron to allow the step to happen, okay? That is the excitation of an electron from an exterior photon. And that's what happens when you, when you shine a light on something and you cause, you, you cause it to start glowing, right? This would be an example of it, okay? All right, so the only allowed changes in energies are those corresponding to a transition between energy levels. The electron cannot exist between them, all right, or in the intermediate, intermediary. It has to exist at one of these integer multiples of energy levels. So according to the following diagram, for the electron energy levels of a hydrogen atom, which of the following is an energy that a hydrogen atom can lose through an electron transition, okay? So which is a possible answer? 10, 1.9, 15.2, or 10.3 electron volts? Which one is possible? Remember, you can skip a level, right? Make sure you have an answer. Pause if you need to, right? Make, check your understanding. 1.9, because 1.9 would be, I think that's the 12.8 to the 10.2. Let's see, which one is it? 12.1, 10.2, that's it. Yep, it's this one. 12 or 1.9, see it? 1.9 electron volts, okay? Now, notice we, meant, we mentioned in the problem, we said according to the following diagram, the electron energy levels, which of the following is the energy that a hydrogen atom can lose? Now, we could say gain two, right? Any step that the electron can take in one direction, it can take the other way. Sometimes, by the way, one, one way is more likely than the other. I haven't mentioned the implication of electrons losing energy. I've, I've said that, okay, it needs exactly this much energy to take the step. That energy has to come in. It's going to come in as, as a photon, okay? But the, no electron will stay in the higher energy level for long. They get excited up to there, and then they will go back down. Not instantaneously, okay? There's a delay of some fraction of a second usually, right? Usually a, a small fraction of a second. But that's, that is the, the constant concept. The electron doesn't stay excited. It's an unstable situation. It will relax back down, right? Because there's, there is just, it, it is, it's less stable, okay? All right, so important idea. Okay, so what have we learned in this section, right, about the structure of matter, okay? Well, we've, we've learned that matter is made of atoms, which consist of a nucleus of protons and neutrons surrounded by a cloud of electrons, okay? We learned about the phases of matter and how they correspond to energy, right? Including getting right down to the nitty gritty of losing a bunch of electrons. And then we even saw that we can then consider electrons in more detail that aren't ionized, but just excited around the nucleus and how those particular energy levels co correspond to particular elements. No two elements have the same set of energy numbers. The numbers we were seeing were the actual numbers for hydrogen, but any different element would have different numbers, all right?
And I'll leave you with a consideration here. So we had a energy difference of 13.1 electron volts, okay, for the hydrogen atom to go from level one to level two. Well, what wavelength light would we need to make that transition? Well, here's the cool thing. We can find it rather easily by combining the idea from this lecture and the one from the previous lecture, the videos that is, the two sections of this chapter five. Because if you recall, we had an equation that said the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of light. Well, that energy has to be equal to the energy of the gap, okay? So we know then that the 13.1 electron volts, which is 13.1 times 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, all right, so that's the energy of the transition has to be equal to H, Okay, Planck's constant, I'll write in the number in a moment, and we'll replace F with, well, C over lambda from the equally important equation that the speed of light equals wavelength times frequency. So replacing that F with C over lambda, we have HC over lambda. That means we can find exactly what wavelength will achieve this. Why solve for wavelength? Well, wavelength is what we think of when we think of color. So, you know, whether it's visible light or just, you know, near visible light, so once we find wavelength, we can say, oh, well, this is the type of light that would both stimulate this transition in hydrogen and that hydrogen, hydrogen would release and potentially that we could see if it's visible light when the hydrogen relaxes. That would be the emission of hydrogen, like a neon sign, but a hydrogen emission tube. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and solve for the wavelength. So then the wavelength is going to be HC over the value you saw on the left-hand side, HC being 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds times the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, all over 13.1, all right, 13.1, there we are, converted to joules with the 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Right there, we'll give you the wavelength and tell you what type of light it is, plug in those numbers yourself and figure out the mystery. Is it infrared? Is it red? Is it blue? What color is it? All right, well that concludes this third section in chapter five. In the next video, we'll cover the final section where we'll talk a lot about how these ideas are put to use in astronomy in allowing us to make discoveries and connections. All right, well thank you so much for watching. I hope this video has been interesting and helpful.